what a joy to be back with you again. I've been looking forward to it ever since we talked about it last week, and uh, so it just worked out good. I'm impressed with the uh, program of your youth camp. Wonderful what you do. We were having a real rough time in, uh, back in, the, er, in around 1960. All of those steel mills up in Pennsylvania went on strike. So steel got to be at a shortage. And my dad worked with the railroad. Railroads were shut down. And it was in the middle of all of that, we had a youth camp. Dad couldn't afford to send us to youth camp, but he somehow scraped up enough money to get my brother and I. Uh, there was just two of us there. My youngest brother was a little too young. And, um, and uh, we went to youth camp, and it was quite an investment. Now here I am preaching the gospel. My brother has been in Cleveland, Ohio for many years, 21 years actually, pastoring a church up there. And, uh, and it's amazing what that in little investment did in a couple of boys' lives and uh, no telling what else. But So what you're doing is exceptional. Thank you. Thank you for those children. And, uh, and you don't know, there could be another Billy Sunday in the group that gets saved this summer or another Billy Graham, so be it, or whatever. You don't ever know. But do the very best you can. I, I'm proud of that. And uh, thank you for what you're doing for the young people. It's good to be with you. It's good to be back in uh, Parkersburg and have an opportunity to be with your pastor and his wife. And I'm telling you what, that lady is a cook. Oh, <laughs> my, my, my. And uh, <laughs> I see that you already know that. But, uh, but anyway, uh, we thoroughly enjoy being with, with the family. I want to uh, talk a little bit here tonight on a subject that I think you will be blessed by, you'll get something from it that will possibly help in some time to come, and, and I trust that, that uh, this is something you can take home with you, uh, and that is this subject. Being a pastor, I've had an occasion a lot of times to be in a hospital room when somebody died. But it, I didn't have to wait till I was a pastor to experience this. I was just a little boy when I was with an aunt, my mother's sister, when she passed away at the middle, somewhere in the middle 30s, she died with cancer. And as the years have gone by, I, I, I was a pi I've been a pilot for years. I flew uh, ambulances and uh, air ambulances. I've, I've airlifted. I've done all kinds of these things. And I've been with people many times when they died. When I pastored my first church, I drove an ambulance. And I have been with people who I were taken to the hospital and on the way they died. I remember one night when I got a phone call uh, in the middle of the night to go to this certain crossroad along the Natchez Trace Parkway. And there were that night, nine people died in an accident. As we were searching for people throughout that intersection, you could hear somebody in the background yell, and I stopped. Stopped. There were a few that lived through that, but not many. It was, it was amazing. About four o'clock in the morning and everybody met at that intersection at the same time. It was, it was strange. But I heard somebody yelling and I went out into a cornfield and found a girl who would stand up and yell, God have mercy, and fall down. And she finally, she was running from me. She'd get up, fall down, get up, fall down. And I, I picked her up I finally, when she fell the last time, picked her up and carried her back to the ambulance and put her in there, and in moments, she was gone. And what is amazing is that as a pastor, I have been with them when this happened, and the family member looked at me and said, Brother Duncan, where did they go? 
They were here just a moment ago. I remember Doug. His name was Doug Trahan. He was a lineman in Wichita, Kansas at the airport. Young fellow, about 23, 24 years old. Sharp, young man. And I ran into him one day at a hospital. And he had a coat hanging over his shoulder. It was in a sling. And it was in the winter. And I said, Doug, you okay? And he said, well, he said, I had this knot removed right under here. And the doctor called me and uh, wanted me to come see him. And he said, I hope it's not bad news, but it was. And sure enough, a few weeks later, I'm in the hospital with Doug. And his mother would say, breathe, Doug, breathe. And he'd take a breath and fade back out. And she'd yell, breathe, breathe, Doug. And he'd take another breath. And it's only moments. And he'd be hearing her again. This probably went on an hour. Two or three times I started to leave the hospital. I was with another pilot friend. And Doug had been coming to our church. And, uh, and I, I really, really liked the guy. He's just a fine fellow. And I'm watching him as his mother's telling him to breathe. And I turned to Dan and Dan said, well, you ready? And I said, yeah. My, he said, let's just wait a minute longer. And sure enough, in a moment, his mother yelled, breathe one more time. And she kept yelling, breathe. And Doug never breathed again. She looked at me and she said, where did he go? I've had that question asked many a time. Where did they go? And all of us are going to face this at some time or another. And all of us have faced it at some time or another. Whether it be a parent, a grandparent, or some cousin, or... Even a brother or sister, we've experienced it in some fashion or other. And every one of us have been, uh, what would I want to say? We've grieved because of it, and, and reasonably so. But the big question, where did they go? That's what I want to address. Where did they go? Now, to tell you where they went, you can't go in the Bible and just pick out a chapter and say, all right, it explains it all. It's not that way. You've got to take the whole picture and look at it. And a lot of things we don't know. And those things we don't know, you can only use your imagination to figure it out. And maybe even that doesn't really figure it out. So what we have to do is look what the Scripture said. Now, we know that in the Old Testament, well, that's a little bit different than it is in the New Testament. So let's just look at it for a moment. Let's go way back to try to understand this. Go back before Adam and Eve in the garden. When the Bible said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the next part said, and the earth was without form and void and darkness upon, upon the face of the deep. Before any of this, God was. We know that he created angels. The scripture tells us that. He created lots of angels. And lo and behold, at some point in time and eternity past, it's almost, uh, how, how would you describe it? It's almost an oxymoron. But eternity past, somewhere back there, one of those angels got kind of high and mighty. Isaiah chapter 14, at verse 12, begins the story of that angel that got high and mighty and thought that he ought to be equal with God. He had such a convincing story to tell that from what we can understand, about a third of the angels believed him and followed him. That angel's name was Lucifer. Called the son of the morning. How art thou fallen from heaven? Well, God had enough of it and dispatched his mighty angel to have him thrown out of heaven. Later, when Jesus came on the scene, and Matthew, he tells about it, Jesus made this statement. God hath prepared hell for the devil and his angels. That's what he said. Jesus said it. God prepared hell, not for me and you, but for the devil and his angels. 
Now then, time would come into being and Adam and Eve would be created, the waters from the land separated and the, all the things that happened in that first week as we know it. And then, of course, man was created and then, and then woman and, you know, the rest of the story. And, you know, then how that later... Eve partook of the fruit that she wasn't supposed to take of, and there was the sin that I talked about in regard to the lion of the tribe of Judah. There was the sin. Now they're cast out of the garden. Later, the scripture would say, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all men that forget God. A place that wasn't prepared for man. And now because of the sin. So throughout the Old Testament, when God had that conversation that I talked about the last time with the serpent, and He said, I'm going to bring about one day a, a miracle birth. He said, call it the seed of woman. And you might bruise His heel, but He's going to bruise your head. He's going to conquer all. So now then, from that time on, the Old Testament, throughout all the Old Testament, they are anticipating the arrival of this one that's going to destroy Satan. So they're looking for him. The prophets prophesied about it, on through many, many things that took place. Don't have time to go through them all. But they knew that there's coming this promised one. Isaiah had a lot to say about it probably more than any of the other prophets did, he talked about this man coming and that he would be uh, despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Then if you go on down to chapter 61, he put it this way, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's speaking in prophetic terms, anointed me to preach the gospel, to preach deliverance to the captives, to set at liberty them that are bound, and so forth and so on. Now what's he talking about? This that I'm about to say is vague. We don't fully understand it. Jesus came on the scene later and explained it a little better. But throughout the Old Testament, every time a person died, whoever they were, they went to hell. It sounds strange. But when Jesus explained it, we understood it better. Because hell was made up of two parts. And I'll just using my imagination here, there was a part over here on this one side that we call hell, the lake of fire, we often refer to it, or that place of torment, the weeping, the wailing, the gnashing of teeth, hell. But there was a part here, a separation, a guff that Jesus talked about. And over here on the other side was another part of hell. But the Bible calls it paradise. Paradise is later referred to paradise moving to another place. But paradise, it's also called a place of captivity. It was also called Abraham's bosom. Hell. When men died in the Old Testament, everybody who died, they either went to over there or over here. If they were ungodly, they went over there. God, being the righteous judge, put the ungodly there and the righteous here. We know some who went here. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the old patriarchs of old, because some things that took place there made us understand it. Jesus would later talk about the gates of hell. We've used that scripture as preachers a lot of times when we say, yeah, life is tough and we're having a hard time and the church is struggling with some issues, but thank God the gates of hell don't prevail against the church, meaning that we've got victory in Jesus Christ. And that's a good way to use it. Technically, that's not what it means. Jesus said to his disciples, after he asked them the question, who do men say that I am? They had some things, well, some say you this prophet and others and so forth. He, but who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Peter said. Of course, it flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. Well, in my common, simple way of thinking, hell had gates. I don't know if that meant that here on this part, there's a gate right up there at the top of a stairway, or I don't know how it would be, but let's just think about it like that. And over here on the other side, another gate, or is there one in the middle? And God just sends them to wherever they go. Being the judge he is, righteous judge, he knew exactly where to send them. So all through the Old Testament, the righteous, when they would die, come here. The ungodly, on the other hand, would come here. And then, as time would continue on, one day, there was a young fellow came out preaching. He's coming. Make way for him. Who are you? My name's John. John the Baptist, they call me. The Bible called him the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Telling the people, make way, he's coming. This deliverer is coming. He's coming. He had such a sermon and such following till some people thought that he may be the Messiah. And they sent a delegation out from Jerusalem to go ask him. And they said, are you the one that's supposed to be coming or what? He said, I'm not him, but there comes one after me mightier than I whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He baptizes with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. One day, while this man John was baptizing believers in the Jordan River, behold, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, walked up on the shore. John down in the water said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came into the river and John baptized him. The Bible said that after the baptism was over, a dove lit on Jesus. A voice from heaven said, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus went out of the water and went about doing good, starting his ministry. Some of the disciples of John even followed him. And he went about, well, John didn't know when to hush. He kept on preaching. I like to put it like this. He preached one sermon too many. You know that story. Yep, preached one sermon. It was a little tough. And so the rest of the story, you can see it, but he got his head cut off. Well, when that happens... What's next? So if you go back and look at all through the Old Testament, they had been coming here. There's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all these that I mentioned earlier. And old Isaiah. Now, if I'd have been Isaiah, I know that there's coming one that's going to set those people li at liberty one day. I prophesied about it. So I come in here on the day of my death, and I came walking into hell. Hey, has anybody seen him yet? He's coming, he's coming. Is he not here? No, he's not here yet. Well, if he's not, I'm going to get just as close to that gate as I can get because I know he's coming. Now, in my mind, I figure the next fellow that walked through the gate, he probably said, are you him? <laughs> no, I'm not. Who are you? My name's Jeremiah. I'm looking for him. He's not here? No, he's not here. I'm waiting at the gate here for him. I don't know this went on. We don't know. You don't know that it didn't, so I like my version better. And, <laughs> and, and, and I figure then in a few minutes, there's Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, all of them came through that gate and every one of them looking for him. And they probably, all of them lined up at the gate down here waiting on him to show up. Whenever old John the Baptist got his head cut off, I don't think that there was much time in between, it probably just a moment, the gates of hell opened and there stood old John with his head on straight. <laughs> I don't know that Isaiah did this, but he may have. 
And I think if I'd have been Isaiah, I'd have, I'd have, this may be him. Are you him? If I'd have asked him that question, I know what he'd have said. I'm not him. But there comes one after me mightier than I whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He baptizes with the Holy Ghost and with fire and he is not far behind. I know him. He's coming soon. And old John, matter of fact, probably said, I'm going to stand here and wait with you. And they're staying in there waiting in hell, looking for this anticipation because they've all been in this place of captivity because of the sin of Adam and Eve all these years. And they're waiting on that promised one to come. Jesus, on the other hand, is on earth, going about preaching the gospel, telling people about this place. They don't get it. One time he made this statement to his disciples. As Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. They didn't get it. He would make other statements about it, and finally one day when they were together, he said, there was a certain rich man. Now, some people teach this is a parable. No, this is not a parable. A parable never uses the term a certain person. Nor does a parable ever call anybody's name in it. And in this instance, both are here. He said, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a beggar who lay at his gate named Lazarus, full of sores, begging crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So now you've got a rich man and you've got Lazarus. Jesus is telling the story of two people he knew. Now it gets good here. Enough to make a Presbyterian want to shout. It said, Lazarus died. Now, is that the shouting part? No, but what comes next is. And the angels came and got Lazarus, and they brought him to Abraham's bosom. They brought him. Now, hallelujah. Brother Duncan, what is it about that that make you want to shout? Next verse. The rich man died, and there's no mention of angels. He lifted up his eyes in hell. What does that tell me? It tells me that every time a saint of God lays down their life, they don't do it by themselves. Whoever wrote that old song years ago that said, When I come to the river at ending of day, when the last winds of sorrow have gone, there will be somebody waiting to show me the way. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. When we come to that place that we're about to die, you as a child of God don't have to fear death because the angels are there to assist the child of God in death. If I were to step off this podium and go back there among you and have you to tell your stories, no doubt some of you could start stories. about You know, when my mother died, when my daddy died, when my grandmother died, when uncle so-and-so passed away. You should have been there, Brother Duncan. Here's what happened. And you can tell stories. Let me tell you. It kind of reminds me of old brother, a fellow's name was Evans. He was a pastor that lived about 30 miles maybe from me when I grew up as a boy. I went to his church some, uh, visiting and that kind of thing. He liked me. Old brother Evans stood about that tall and he was about that way. And he uh, he was just a great guy and uh, and a happy go lucky fellow, but he had a heart attack and and uh, he had a daughter in her family that came to our church where where we live and um, her name was Breland, a precious family and they had she had a son my age and anyway old brother Evans had a heart attack and died in the hospital a couple of weeks later the daughter at our church said to the pastor on a Sunday morning service stood up and said. Could I say a word? And he said, well, sure. And uh, she said, I want to tell you about my daddy dying. And she started on the story 
about how a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was he had died, I don't, it, it couldn't have been a month, it was just like a week or two later. And, and she's, she said, when, when he was at the point of death, he had not said a word for a couple of days, just lying there. When suddenly he said, do you hear that beautiful music? Daddy, there's no music listening into the speaker there in the hospital. There's no music there. Oh, yes, it is. And then this preacher saw something that they didn't see. Who is the guest in our room? Daddy, it's just us. No, no, I'm talking about our guest. <laughs> Glory to God. And this old preacher, knowing the scripture well, realized what was happening. He said, I must be dying. I'm not dying. I'm just starting to live. And he slipped on out right then and there. Oh, man, what a testimony. I have been down those roads over and over again. I remember right here in town, my first day in this town, a fellow took me around, introduced me to places, and went down to the youth detention center on the south end. He said, I want you to meet this guy because he lets me come in here and have a Bible study with these kids. He said, but he's kind of a rough old Marine drill sergeant. And he said, so just ignore him. And, but he's a good guy. He's letting us do it. And I said, yeah, I'd like to, meet, like to meet him. His name was Jerry. We went in there, and um, I met Jerry. Here's what Jerry said. He called me Duncan from the first time he met me. All he ever called me was Duncan. He said, Duncan, you and Bill come in here and have church with these kids all you want to. Great, great, come. They need all you can get them. Give them. Give them everything you can give them. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want you preaching to me. And I knew if I was going to say anything, I better do it right now. I said, Jerry, rest assured, we'll never be on your back. But it'll always be in our heart. We'll always be interested in you. And if at any time you ever want to show up at the church, you ever need prayer, you ever need anything we can do, you let us know. And we'll be glad to respond. But we won't be on your back now. We're not going to do that. And he said, well, I just want to understand it. Just leave me alone. I said, sure enough. He came to church the next day and got saved. <laughs> True. We became good friends. He had a heart attack. Had to quit, had to retire. He was quite up in politics. That kind of a job is political in a lot of ways, and he was in politics. And a lot of people knew him. I remember one night, on a Saturday night, the phone rang at the parsonage, and, and a nurse at the hospital said, Jerry wants to see you. I said, Jerry, is he back in the hospital? Because he'd had several issues. He even, went, they even took him to Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic. He didn't like the way they were treating him in the middle of the night. He unplugged everything, put his clothes on, went out and got in a taxi cab and came home. They didn't know what happened to him. They were looking this country over for this man. And, and so the nurse calls me and said that Jerry wants to see you. And I said, well, he's back in the hospital. And she said, yeah, just came in. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll be right there. And I, I, five minutes, I was there at the uh, St. Joe Hospital. And, uh, and I went into the uh, coronary care unit. And the nurse met me, and she took me right back to him. And I walked into the room, and there he was. And he looked at me, and the, the nurse disappeared. And he said, Duncan, I want to talk to you. And I said, what do you need, Jerry? What do you want? He said, I'm going home. I said, don't you start this all over again. You know the mess we got into over that. I'm not going there. I'm talking about home. I said, where are you going, Jerry? He said, well, Jesus, and this I'll tell you, just like he told me, Jesus came in my room a few minutes ago and said he's coming back to get me tonight. And if there was anything I wanted done to get it done, then he'd be back to get me. And he said, so I want to tell you what I want you to do for my funeral. I said, okay. Boy, that medicine's doing a number on Jerry. That's my thinking. So he gave me a whole layout. He told the songs he wanted sung. He told what, some things he wanted me to tell his wife. He told, well, he just gave me a complete layout. Well, that's very good. That's wonderful, Jerry. And I took him very serious, but inside my mind, boy, he's really, really, really having a rough time tonight. Prayed for him and walked out the door. And uh, thinking I'd be back tomorrow to see him. 
when I walked back in the door of the parsonage. I walked in the door and the phone was ringing. It probably just started or else somebody would have answered it. I walked over and picked it up and it was that same nurse. She said, Brother Duncan, could you come back up to the hospital? I tried to catch you before you got away and, and could you come back? I said, I'll be right there. Before I got out of the hospital, the angel of the Lord showed back up in his room and took him home. I had his funeral, a unique funeral, I'm telling you it was, and it was some wonderful things, but I was able to tell that story at his funeral. I'm telling you, there are some things about serving the Lord that the world does not even begin to comprehend. There are things in the spirit realm that you and I don't even begin to understand, but we know there is another part out there somewhere. We know it. And so there's something wonderful. The angels of the Lord picked him up, brought him to Abraham's bosom. Hallelujah. The rich man in hell lifted up his eyes, looked over there on the other side, and he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. That meant Abraham had his arms around him. This is interesting. Abraham lived 1,500 years ago. He never met Abraham, but he knew him. Father Abraham! Isn't it amazing how that here in hell the mind was opened up and knowledge was all there? Would you send Lazarus over here to put his finger in some water, touch my tongue? I am tormented in these flames. He didn't say I'm being consumed in these flames. I'm being tormented in these flames. Over here on the other side, Abraham talked to him. Son, remember? What? There is a memory in hell. Can you imagine the other people in times to come, all through the eternity in hell that remember all of these things? The times that the pastor tried to make them, uh, appeal to them to give their life to the Lord and they wouldn't. The times that you tried to beg them to pray and they wouldn't and now they've got this they wish they had them. They're in hell. Son, remember that in your lifetime you had good things and this fellow had nothing. And today, look at the, look where you got, look where you are. He's got it all, you've got nothing. Furthermore, there is a big gulf between the two places. We can't go over there and you can't come over here. I preached a sermon right here a number of years ago and I titled it, The Most Fervent Appeal Ever Made Was Made in Hell. Think about it. You better believe what this man said he meant it. If you can't help me, would you let Lazarus raise from the dead and go to my five brothers up there and tell them about this horrible place? Because if somebody raises from the dead and tells them, they'll believe it. Isn't it amazing the conclusions that people come to sometimes that's wrong? I mean, what he said sounded good. Yeah, let him raise from the dead. Let him go preach it. Yeah, a lot of people believe it. Not so. Abraham gave him an answer back. He said, no, nope, can't do it. They've got Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe it from anybody raised from the dead. We've got people today who follow miracles. They follow the spectacular. They want to get in on something that's the phenomenal type thing. 
But let me tell you, those things don't build your faith. Faith comes by hearing the pastor preach on Sunday morning. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, whether it's a Sunday school teacher or whomever. Thank God there's where your faith is. Faith is built right now while I'm talking about the word of God. Can't do it. Can't do it. There he is up on earth telling about this. And the disciples aren't really getting it that well. They can't seem to comprehend it. So ends up, there he is. He's going up Calvary's hill now. He falls beneath the load of the cross evidently. And Simon the Serenian is compelled to carry the cross. And now he's up there on the cross, hanging. A thief over here and a thief over there. This one over here said, You're really the Son of God. If you are, why don't you show us some of your power and come down off the cross, take us with you. Kind of tantalizing him, really. Over here on the other side, it was like as though this one didn't like what the other one said. He said, he said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus hanging here said, he didn't even address the other fellow. He looked, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Well, it wasn't too long until he said, it's finished. And his spirit slipped right out of his body. Now, I know Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus came and got the body of our Lord, and they went and put it in a borrowed tomb. I always thought that's so unique. Now, it's even humorous. The only time in history anybody ever said, I need to borrow your casket, but just three days. <laughs> just borrow your casket. But I believe the moment that his spirit slipped out of his body, the gate of hell opened. There he stood. All these old apostles and saints and all these standing waiting and the gate opened. I don't think Isaiah had time to ask him, are you him? I kind of halfway think old John the Baptist standing there probably said, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus came walking into hell. He would spend three days and nights here preaching to these spirits according to what we understand in Scripture, and they would accept him. And somewhere at some time while he was here, we don't know if it's on the front side of the visit or the last side of the visit. I figure it kind of happened like this. Father Abraham, I'll be back. I've got to run an errand. <laughs> oh, what are you going to do, Lord? He said, I've got to go over there. Uh, 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 Nobody, uh, if that had have happened, I know what Jesus would have said. Abraham, you're not thinking. I built this place. I can step over it if I want to. We do know that with one giant leaping step or somehow, he came over here to this side. And, and when I was a young boy, I heard a preacher preaching on this, and he really preached a sermon. He had Jesus coming over here into hell and getting a hold of Satan, and you talk about a wrestling match, they had it. They tore hell up. He had the devil in a helicopter. He had him in a pile driver. He had him in body slams. And, and I mean, it was great. It offered for good entertainment, but I don't think it happened that way. Because Satan cannot stand in the presence of Jesus. I think that when Jesus landed here, Satan probably went flying against the far wall of hell if hell had a wall and probably lay there like a, a damp dish rag or something. And, and Jesus just reached down and picked up what Satan dropped and he came right back over to the other side. I can see Moses said, my Lord, what did you just do? He said, I went and got this. What is this? This is the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. This is what 
Easter is all about. All of you get ready. We're going to empty this place. Where are we going, Lord? We're going to move out of here and we're going to move on high. I want you to go back to where you lay down your bodies and I want you to pick them up. I see Moses said, Lord, I don't know where mine is. <laughs> you know that Bible story. I'm sure that if it, that had happened, Jesus would have assured Moses, you'll find it. Trust me. You just go, you're going to get there. And, and maybe another one stepped up and said, Well, Lord, mine's all, ain't nothing left but bones. If they'd have started that, I know what Jesus would have done. He'd have said, Ezekiel, would you come here a minute? I want you to preach a little while. I don't think all that had to happen, but I, I do know this. Well, again, my imagination, I think Moses might have said, Lord, when I do go get my body, would you mind if I do something that I never got to do before? Before I move on up into where you're talking about paradise above, would you mind if I just went walking through Jerusalem? I never got to see the place. Would you, would you mind if I just went and visited there? Because they've all talked about it. I, I never got there. I got as far as that far mountain over there, and you let me look over there, into, but I never made it. Would you mind if I just walked through the city? I think if Moses said that, I, uh, Jeremiah jumped up there and he said, hey, I know the place quite well. I'll be his guide. Before they got through, there were a whole busload wanting to go down to Jerusalem. <laughs> now, can I prove all that? No. But I can prove to you this. The Bible said in Matthew chapter, 50, uh, uh, chapter 27, verse 53, it said their graves burst open and the saints were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem. We don't really know why. They just did. Jesus probably said, well, while you're going to do that, I've got to do something too. I need to, I need to go back by Calvary. Lord, what do you need to go back by Calvary for? Well, I left something there I've got to get. <laughs> really? What did you leave at Calvary? My blood. Can I prove that? Did he say it? No. But I do know this. The Bible said when he entered into the holies of holies of heaven, the holiest of all, into the presence of God, he went in with his own precious blood. Blood that was spilled for me and you. Blood that was spilled. Blood that we sing about. There's power in the blood. The glorious working of the blood. The blood that cleanses us today. Jesus went into the presence of God with his blood. Hallelujah, the blood that still has its power. Well, Jesus said, I'm going to go first. Paul would later say, he was the first fruit of them that slept. He rose from the dead first. Then the others rose. We don't know what all really happened. We know Jesus lingered for a spirit of time around. We know he was ultimately glorified and he spent some days and what have you. And then he ascended for the final time. We know all about that. But then somebody said, what about this? Whatever happened here? We're, we're not Catholics. We, I've got great admiration and love for Catholic people, and the Catholic Church has brought a lot of things to the church world today that we have to appreciate. But this is one thing that separated us from the Catholic Church. This is the communion was one of them, but this was one of them that separated, that made the early church bishops protest. And they became the Protestants, which are now with accents changed, it's the word Protestant. We're the Protestants. They protested, said, oh no, hell didn't continue here. They call it purgatory, and it's a process kind of a thing that's hard to even begin to explain that they believe in, and they believe it continues. On the other hand, we know Paul said to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So when a person takes their last breath here, they take their next breath in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they don't, no wonder he said, the gates of hell don't prevail against the church we go straight to his arms hallelujah so they take Jesus came he arose 
became a victor because he lives, we live, and today we have salvation like none other because of who Jesus is. I sing a song sometimes uh, that, um, uh, that simply says, death ain't no big deal. And uh, I even thought about it, and if I'd have had the, the soundtrack, I might would have pulled it in here right now on this one, but I didn't. But it simply says, someday when I breathe my final breath, and the doctor takes one look at me and says he's dead. The truth is going to finally be revealed. I'm going to say, death ain't no big deal. The doctor, he'll reach down and close my eyes, but I'll be watching from the other side. I'll be laughing about how scared I thought I'd feel because, friend, death ain't no big deal. <laughs> oh, but on and on it could go with that one. But what I'm saying is, I don't want to die, but I'm going to. One day, unless Jesus returns before then, I hear people get up and they sing such songs as, you know, I'm homesick for heaven and all this. And I wish sometimes they'd just hush. <laughs> oh, I want to go and be with the Lord. Oh, get real. You let a pain rip through their chest and let's see how bad they want to go on. <laughs> now, am I criticizing that? No, not at all. Because death is an enemy. That's why we don't want to face it. It's an enemy. It's the last enemy that Jesus will put under his feet. Until then, we don't want to die. We don't want to. And, and no, we don't want to, but we are going to. And when we do, we have the angels of the Lord to assist us in death. And when we come to that place of crossing over, we're going to do it whether we want to or not. My daddy always, being a railroad man, he would use the term, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go out on that train load today. And that's the way we are, and that's the way it is. No, we don't want to die. We want to do everything we can do to live. But one day when we do face that crossing over, it ain't no big deal. I was preaching about this somewhat like this. I, it may have been a totally different sermon. I don't remember, but I was talking about death. I had a little lady in our church, she's about 84 years old, out in Kansas. Well, she was 84. I remember remarking about it. She came up to me after service, and she said, Brother Duncan, I ain't never wanted to lay down and die so bad in all my life as I have while you are preaching this tonight. <laughs> I didn't mean to want to make her die, but... but uh, uh, but there, the point that I'm making is it's not that big of a thing. While I was pastor here in West Virginia, it wasn't particularly here in Parkersburg, but another place, I got so upset, I didn't say a word, but I got distraught at the way that some people were acting at a funeral. I was ashamed of them. They'd sing in church and shout and rejoice and all of that and wonderful, wonderful. And there at the funeral, they got mad, they got in a fight, they got scrapping. And I, I told them later, I said, where were you whenever I was in church preaching on death and you were in there singing? You either got cotton in your ears or you're missing church. Somewhere down the line, you're not getting the message. And uh, I kind of made them wake up, I guess, a little bit because they were good people. But death is something we all face. I had a heavy burden on my heart right here in town one Sunday night. And I walked to the pulpit or was going to the pulpit to preach. And, uh, and some other things got to happening and, and I never got to preaching the message I wanted to preach. After service, 17-year-old girl went home and committed suicide. That was a wake-up call. How serious it is when we have church. And we come into the house of God to worship Him. Sometimes we may shout and rejoice and all of that is wonderful. And we should. But never at the expense of somebody sitting right beside us that's got a heavy heart that needs to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and us overlook them. Do all you can do in your worship to appeal to that person. And then you may not even know they're that way. You can sit beside someone in church and not know their heart. 
But one day, death is coming to all of us. And I want to be ready when that day comes, don't you? Stand with me. I'm through. Hmm. You have listened to me as good as I have ever seen a congregation listen. And you were, you were hanging on every word I said. And I'm, I, I'm grateful to be able to uh, see you do this. Of course, you're just, you just write in the words what it is. And, uh, and I, I appreciate it. What I want us to do tonight is I want us all just to, well, I don't know if all of us can get up here around the altar area or not, but those of us who can want us to. And I want us to come up and musicians maybe get over here and we're going to sing a song or two about uh, uh, whatever, they want, whatever they pick out and choose and we'll just sing it together and worship. But I want you to, in your heart, I want you to think, I want to go to heaven when I die. And it may be tonight that there's somebody in the building here that does not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And somebody brought you to church tonight and they really wanted you to come and, and you came because they wanted you to come or whatever the reason, I don't know. But you want to know Him as your Savior. I want you to make that choice to serve Him tonight. And I, there was a time that I would get people always to come to the front. And I think that's still important. Because whenever you make that public confession, it'll make you stronger than you can imagine. If you would just simply come to the front and make that confession. But to make it easier for you, I'm going to have others to come with you. And I want those of you, all of you, just come on up toward the front. And we're going to have prayer together now. And we're going to have a time of putting ourselves in the arms of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming. Go ahead and come on, all of you that can. If you physically can't, of course, I understand that. That's not an issue. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us join together in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for touching somebody's heart tonight that doesn't know you. But tonight they've come into the knowledge of you in such a way that they don't want to go to hell. They want to serve you. And not because they just want to miss hell. They they have fallen in love with you because you provided them a way to escape eternity of such fashion. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. And we pray in Jesus' name that they will simply ask you to come into their heart and forgive them of their sin, that they might know you in the full pardon of, your, of their sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done tonight. Thank you for the goodness and mercy that flows over our souls tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. I want you to lift your voices, your hands toward heaven and tell Jesus how much you love him. Just tell him. How he went through the cross of Calvary for me and you. He went to hell, conquered it for me and you. Today we go straight to the arms of Jesus because he conquered it all for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, one of the greatest gifts is when the Word of God comes to life in you. How many of y'all say tonight, <clears throat> this segment of the Word of God came to life in me tonight? Amen. It's, it's a gift of God. And there's nothing greater. You know, as I get older, mortality becomes more real. You know, sometimes when you're young, you think, I'm going to live forever. And then you bump, you know, 40, 50. And you keep going. <clears throat> like Vic, 112. And, uh, you know, um, it's just, it's, it's such a comfort to know. that death has this, as the scripture says oh grave where's your victory oh death where's your sting and Jesus has taken the stinger out of death for us but we do need this encouragement and we need this understanding 
If you're here tonight and you say, Dave, tonight I'm making this thing right that I am never going to the devil's hell. And I'm going to tell you, I may be one of the only people you ever met that have been to hell, but I have been, I have seen hell with my own eyes through a gift of God. And what he described is exactly the truth. I saw the place of torment. I didn't see the side of paradise. I saw the place of torment. And I saw a friend of mine who was there. And it was one of the most horrendous experiences of my life that, you know, 33 years later, it's just as real to me. And it's why I wake up and serve God every day. And I'll never forget when I was vexed in my heart. And I said, God, you can't do this to me. You can't show me hell and not show them. It's not just. And you're a just God. And there's no way it's just that you take me and you show me hell, but you don't show the rest of the world. And I had this vexation in my heart for days. And I'll never forget how the Lord fixed me. Because I really had to question God's integrity when He showed me, but wouldn't show everybody. And then when I would say that, He would always say, I showed you, now you go tell them. And then I would say, they won't believe me. And I was just like that king, that rich ruler. But if one was raised from the dead, they would believe him. And I would tell the Lord, if they seen this, they'd believe. And he'd answer me. He'd say, I showed you, you go tell them. And after about three days, I'll never forget the night, he came to me and he said, open your Bible. And I read this story. And I had wept for days, man. I couldn't talk to people. I felt like I was going to die from the burden of Christ that was in my heart from that 22nd vision of hell. And I'll never forget when I read that story of Lazarus, and then when I read those words that said from Abraham, if he doesn't believe the prophets, he would not believe one risen from the dead. And the Lord said, every time you tell your story, I will bear witness in their heart by the power of my spirit. And if they don't believe you, they wouldn't believe it if they saw it themselves. And I realized that day the power of the witness of the Holy Ghost how he does bear witness in our hearts that we are the children of God and he'll bear witness in our hearts and and then I remember another time the Lord I was having this struggle about I had several dreams in my life that I was going to be martyred and maybe it's because I was in Bible college reading the Fox's book of martyrs I don't know but I had these dreams I was going to be martyred and I was I was scared because I said Jesus I don't know if I could die for you if somebody put a gun to my head and I remember one day the Lord told me this he said if I give you grace to live for me I'll give you grace to die for me and I believe that with all my heart amen and tonight I believe there's people in this room that number one eternity came in the room and mortality came in the room and met amen eternity came in the room and mortality came in the room and met and our hearts were convicted of our mortality and convinced of our eternity amen and that's a good thing and hearts are comforted in this and I too over many years have been able to be with people and see these miraculous times that people go into the presence of the Lord and there are some pretty incredible things that happen but we know this the grave has lost its victory and death has lost its sting for us amen if you're here tonight and you say I want to make sure I don't ever 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 go to that place the devil's hell paradise is closed now it's heaven or hell it's heaven or hell. It's to be with the presence of the Lord or it's to be with the presence of Lucifer and his fallen angels. And I don't know about you, but I want to be in the presence of the Lord. Pray this prayer with me out loud. If you want to really 
lock things up with God. And you, of course, you've got to mean this in your heart. You've got to follow through with it. It's not a magic formula. It's a commitment of your life to Christ. But just pray this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I do commit my heart to you. I do ask you to forgive my sins. To cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I cannot save myself. Never can. Never will. I need a Savior. And I need someone to run my life. Because I'll just make a mess of it. So Jesus, I don't just ask you to be my Savior. I ask you to be my Lord, my King, the director of my life. And I commit my heart to you. My mortality, I commit to your eternity. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And I can announce to you, when you pray a prayer like that, your sins are forgiven. Amen. I love saying that to people. I've said that to thousands of people. They're just looking at it. Your sins are forgiven you. For the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Amen. That's an awesome thing. That's an awesome thing. Jesus told the church, He said, Whosoever sins you remit are remitted. And who's ever sinned, you retain or retain. That's the power of the church. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you can return to your seats here a moment. And if you prayed that prayer, and if you've never gotten one of these little books of mine that I wrote called What Now? A handbook for New Believers. We'll have some of these up here. You can just come up and get one at, at the end of the service. It's our gift for anyone who's trying to start a, a life right with Jesus. Amen. As you're getting in your seats there, we want to receive a love offering for Pastor Chuck and help him on his journeys and travels. He's been preaching this gospel for a long time. Helped a lot of people. And one thing my pastor sowed into me when I was younger... He said, Dave, and he's told me this. We've had this conversation over and over. If you need an offering envelope, just get an offering envelope. He said, Dave, he said, one thing I want to encourage you in. He said, somebody has got to take care of the men of God in the later seasons of their life. And so many pastors give their lives to churches 20, 30, 40 years. And then the church one day says, you know what? We're ready for some young blood. And they set them on the street. I remember about 19, probably around 1990, I was in my prime in the ministry, just doing great. And this gentleman came to my church one day and over in Jackson, Ohio, and walked in my office and sat down. And he was probably in his mid-60s. And he looked at me and he said, I'd like to talk to you about your future. And I said, well, okay. And he, he started wanting to talk to me about financially investing. And I looked at him and I said, man, you know, I'm... 30 years old, man. Jesus will come back before I ever retire. And he looked at me and he, he said, young man, he said, I pastored a church for 30 years, built a great church. He said, one day I walked in my, my office and the board met me and said, uh, we're releasing you. You're too old now. We want somebody younger. And they set him on the street. He said, I'm in my 60s now. And he said, I've made the rest of my life's work is to go find young men like you and help them prepare for a future because the church may not take care of you. That didn't mean much to me at 30, but it sure means a lot to me at 56. And you know, I watched my pastor over the years, Pastor Bob Nichols, I watched him bring in men of God who were seasoned men of God who'd stood the test of time and preached the gospel without compromise for a lifetime and bless them and pay their bills 
I could tell you the name of three or four preachers. He paid their house payment. He took care of them. And he, he, he instilled that in me. He said, Dave, don't you ever forget the men of God as they begin to move in the later seasons of their life and then someday someone won't forget you. And I just want to sow into this couple tonight. And so we're going to receive a love offering for them. And they're not retired, they're refired. But, you know, I, I just want to appreciate a lifetime of faithfully serving Christ. A lifetime. That's an awesome thing. Six or 40, 40 years of marriage. How many people can you find been married? Faithfully pastored church after church. Served God now out funding missions all over the world. At almost 70 years of age, out funding missions all over the world. That's pretty cool. So I'm telling you, we're sowing into good ground tonight. We're sowing into ground that God will honor and respect your offering. Amen. Go ahead and receive that, gentlemen. Our prayer team's going to come up here tonight. If you need prayer tonight, we would uh, invite you to come up and get prayer before you go. Thank you for coming out tonight. I believe I was encouraged, and I believe you were encouraged, and I believe my faith was strengthened. I believe your faith was strengthened. Amen. But I appreciate these servants of God. Appreciate what they've sown. And if I have anything to do with it, what they reap. Amen. Stand with me tonight. Hallelujah. We bless you the rest of the week. We're going to have a great week. And again, please continue to pray for our youth camp. That uh, God will move in a mighty way. A mighty way. And... Uh, We'll see our young people touched for eternity. Amen. We love you and bless you. If you need prayer tonight, come and get prayer before you leave. Have an awesome rest of the week.